The ZX81 had a 16K RAM expansion pack available, which used dynamic memory. Interestingly, this expansion cost the same as the kit form of the ZX81 itself. Can I ask you about the new RAM pack attachment? Yes, well, it was thought that we might do something to boost the machine's memory. This RAM pack has some infamy associated with it. Yes, right, because a lot of our readers are saying um, that the connection's not that good, um, that they fall off. We are aware of, of this issue. Our engineers have looked into it, and I am informed that the use of a piece of blue tack about the size of a runner beam will resolve the problem. Blue tack? Quite so. But there are a few surprises with this gem, so let's open it up and have a look. There are two printed circuit boards crammed into this little box. We have some analog circuitry on the left, and not surprisingly, we have eight dynamic RAM chips. These are four 116 16K by 1 bit dynamic RAMs, which we'll go over in quite a bit more detail later. On the second board, there are seven of these 7400 series logic chips. This is interesting, because four of them are 74LS157s, which we found in the ZX80. The 74LS00 is a quad dual input NAND gate, while the 74LS32 is the OR gate equivalent. But what's this? A 74LS393. What's that doing here? By way of comparison, the VIC 28K expansion card only had one 7400 series logic chip. Also, note that the RAM chips in this expansion are much larger, despite having the same capacity of 16 kilobits. These chips have 24 pins, and they come in a 600mm wide package. To understand how the ZX80 and 81 RAM expansion works, we need to look at it in the context of the whole machine. Let's briefly recap how the ZX80 and ZX81 generate video. Remember that the timing for raster generation is under direct Z80 control. It generates horizontal sync and vertical sync, and these need to be cycle accurate. Now, there are quite a few tricks used to achieve this. But the first trick was to make the ZADC no up instructions while screen data was being fetched from the memory. This is done by splitting the data bus with some resistors. While we're scanning video data from the memory, the no up generator is active and the ZADC's no up instructions and counts up. Next, the refresh circuitry inside the Z80 is hijacked. Each Z80 instruction fetch is at least four clocks long. It fetches the instruction from memory then performs a DRAM refresh. So, what the ZX80 and ZX81 do is read a character from the display, store it in some flip-flops I call the character register, and then during the refresh portion of the cycle, it feeds this screen character data, together with a character line count, back into the ROM and reads out the bit mask for that line of the character. Then, it feeds this into a shift register and sends the data out sequentially to the screen. This is an approximate block diagram for the ZX80 and ZX81. The ZX80 uses discrete 7400 series logic, while the ZX81 implements this in its Unified Logic Array, or ULA chip. We're looking at what happens during the active part of a scan line where pixels are being displayed. In the instruction fetch part of the CPU cycle, the Z80 outputs the memory address of the current character to be displayed. The no up generator is active, so the Z80 sees a no up, while the character data stored in the static RAM at that location is latched into the character register. The second part of the CPU instruction fetch cycle is normally used to refresh DRAM, but here we use a set of 2 to 1 multiplexes to direct the character data and line count back to the ROM, which then looks up a character bitmask table. The 8 pixels for that character and line number are fetched and sent to the shift register to generate the video for display. The design also uses some cleverness with the refresh register inside the CPU to keep track of the character count within a scan line and generate an interrupt at the end. Does it matter that we've hijacked part of the refresh cycle to generate video? Well, not really, 
because the base models for the ZX80 and ZX81 only contain static RAM which doesn't need to be refreshed. But that's not the case for the memory expansion. The 4116 was the memory used in the expansion unit, so let's go over that chip in more detail. Each chip has 16,384 memory bits arranged into an array of 128 by 128 memory cells. This means 8 chips are required for the 16 kilobyte memory. Looking at the chip, you might be wondering why they only have 7 address pins when 14 address lines are required to access an array of 16K. Well, to save pins, the chip accepts two lots of 7-bit address lines fed in sequentially as two transactions. This is a block diagram of the chip internally. Let's say we want the Z80 to perform a main memory read at location 495D hex. We designate the bottom 7 bits to be the row address, which is 5D, while bits A7 through A13 form the column address, which is 1 2 hexadecimal in this case. Let's look at the read cycle. The first thing that happens at the start of a read cycle is that some external hardware presents the 7 bit row address on the external pins of the DRAM. Next, the row address strobe or RAS signal is asserted, and this latches the value on the 7 external address pins into the row address buffer. Next, the row decoder selects column 93, which is 5D in hexadecimal, and all 128 memory cells in that row discharge their capacitor into a 128-bit internal bus. Obviously, only those storing a charge, representing a 1, actually discharge their value onto the bus. This ever so slightly changes the voltage on each line of the 128-bit internal bus, but enough to be detected by the synth amplifiers. From there, the data goes into the I.O. switch. It's important to note that this occurs before the chip even knows the column address. A short time later, the column address from the Z80 is presented on the seven external address pins, which is one two hexadecimal in this case. The column address strobe, or CAS, is asserted, and the data is latched into the column address buffer. The DRAM chip now has the entire 14-bit address stored internally. Next, column 18 is selected, which is 12 hexadecimal, and the lower I.O. switch associated with column 18 forwards this one bit of data, and only this one bit of data, to the output pin of the chip. We've just read the data in row 5D, column 12, but we're not done yet. The cell matrix at row 5D used up all the charge in the capacitors during the initial read, so now row 5D is empty, but the data is still stored in the I.O. switch. To solve this problem, at the end of RAS, all 128 bits stored in the I.O. switch are written back to the cell memory, and that data is good for another 2 milliseconds. Once this is all done, the chip needs some time to prepare the internal 128-bit bus for the next memory access, and this takes at least 100 nanoseconds. So the entire random access cycle time for the chip is 320 nanoseconds. But there's a bit more to the story than just reading and writing. The charge stored in the memory cell capacitors is lost in 2 milliseconds, so we need to keep topping them up. We do this with a RAS-only refresh. During RAS, the row address is latched and the entire row writes data onto the internal 128-bit bus. This is detected by the sense amplifiers and stored in the I.O. block. But what happens if there's no CAS? Well, when the RAS cycle ends, the chip just writes this data back into the memory cell matrix. Except this time, all the capacitors storing the data are fully charged and it's good for another 2 milliseconds. This is good for one row of the cell matrix, but we need to refresh all the rows in the matrix every 2 milliseconds. This is the schematic diagram for the ZX81 16K expansion pack. It has its own circuit for generating plus 12 and minus 5 volts for the DRAM chips, but I'm not going to go over it in detail here. Next, we have a bank of 8 4116 DRAM chips. Then, we have two sets of 2 to 1 multiplexer pairs. Again, these are the 74LS157s that we saw in the ZX80 design. 
Put simply, when select is low, one set of inputs is routed to the output, and when select is high, the other set of inputs are connected to the output. Next, we have this 74LS393 dual 4-bit ripple counter, configured as a single 8-bit counter. Now, here's the main trick behind the design. The 74LS393 is acting as an external refresh counter. This does the job that the refresh counter in the Z80 normally does, but can't do it now because it's busy counting characters in the scan line. Let's see how it works. During the RAS cycle of a main memory read or write, the multiplexes are configured so that address bits A0 through A6 of the Z80 go through to the DRAM chips. During CAS, address lines A7 through A13 go through. But during refresh, the output from the 8-bit external refresh counter goes through to the DRAM and provides the refresh row address. Just like the internal refresh counter, this counter is clocked by the Z80 refresh bar signal. The timing for RAS comes directly from the MREC bar signal from the CPU, which is active during memory accesses and during refresh, while CAS is generated by a read or a write when A14 is set. There is a delay before the top multiplexer switches, which is caused by this resistor capacitor delay circuit, and then the actual CAS signal is delayed a bit further with the use of a second RC delay. Here's a block diagram for our ZX81. When the expansion pack is added, the signal here effectively disables the internal 1K of static RAM. Let's remove that from our diagram and replace it with our 16K expansion pack. Now what happens during scan out? Well, the Z80 thinks it's doing an instruction fetch, but it outputs the address of the current character to be displayed. We do a DRAM read and the data goes into the character register. Note that this only needs to be 7 bits, not 8. Then, in the second half of the instruction fetch cycle, which is when refresh is meant to occur, the top multiplexer is configured to send the character and line number through to the ROM, which then sends its bitmap data through to the shift register for video out. But here's really the crux of this video. At the same time, during the refresh cycle, the multiplexers are configured to send a row address from the external refresh counter, and a DRAM refresh cycle occurs. This is how the DRAM keeps its contents safe on the ZX81. Demand for the ZX81 has been phenomenal. Our only problem is how to meet the orders. It's incredible. I want the spectrum brought forward. In the next video, I'll look at the transition from the 16K ZX81 to the 16K spectrum.